On behalf of the Taubman Center for American Politics and Policy at Brown University, I'd like to welcome you to our presentation featuring Dr. Laura Kahn of the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. I'm Richard Arenberg, visiting professor of the practice of political science and a senior fellow at the Watson Institute. I'm honored to serve this year as interim director of the Taubman Center for American Politics and Policy. Welcome to the many Brown students, faculty, alumni, and other interested citizens who are joining us virtually. The Taubman Center seeks to influence American politics and policy through scholarship, public opinion polling, conferences, workshops, academic research, internships, and a robust series of speakers drawn from experts, the media, academia, think tanks, and public officials. The Taubman Center for several years has focused its efforts on three themes, the pursuit of security, the cost of living, and challenges to our democracy in America. This year, we're placing special emphasis on the national elections and the subsequent consequences as the nation grapples with issues of social justice, public health, education, the economy, and commitment to the rule of law. Today, we're delighted to join Brown's Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies in sponsoring this event, One Health and Leadership During the COVID-19 pan Pandemic. And it's, it's an honor to welcome our speaker, Dr. Khan, and now I will turn the mic over to uh, my colleague, the director of the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies at Brown, Dr. Adam Levine. Thank you so much. And on behalf of the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs, we are very pleased to be co-sponsoring this event today along with the Taubman Center. The mission of our center is to promote a more just, peaceful, and secure world by furthering a deeper understanding of global human rights and humanitarian challenges and encouraging collaborations between local communities, academics, and practitioners to develop innovative solutions to these challenges. Please take a look at our website for more information about our center's research, teaching, as well as opportunities for students and the chance to sign up for our mailing list and find out about future events. In particular, uh, we are going to be launching a new series titled Human Rights and Humanitarianism in Action, a dialogue series at the intersection of human rights and humanitarian aid, which we will be kicking off on November 20th with a talk by Rania Godban, Humanitarian Protection Advisor at the Center for Excellence in Disaster Management and Humanitarian Assistance. She will be discussing the challenges and opportunities for the protection of civilians in conflict. But without further ado, I am pleased to introduce to you our speaker for today, Dr. Laura Khan, who is a physician and research scholar with the Program on Science and Global Security at the Princeton University School of Public and International Affairs. Her education and training span nursing, medicine, public health, and public policy. She is the author of Who's in Charge? Leadership During Epidemics, Bioterror Attacks, and Other Public Health Crises. Originally published in 2009 by Prager Security International, a second edition has been issued in 2020 with a new preface discussing leadership during the COVID-19 pandemic. In 2006, Dr. Khan helped launch the One Health Initiative, which seeks to improve the health of all species by increasing communication and collaboration between human, animal, and environmental slash ecosystem health specialists. Her second book, One Health and the Politics of Antimicrobial Resistance, was published in June 2016 by Johns Hopkins University Press. Princeton University awarded Dr. Khan's course, Hogs, Bats, and Ebola, an Introduction to One Health Policy, with a 250th anniversary fund for innovation in undergraduate education. Recently, the course has been released as a free online Coursera course, Bats, Ducks, and Pandemics. 
A native of California, Dr. Khan holds a BS degree in nursing from UCLA, a medical doctorate from Mount Sinai School of Medicine, a master's in public health from Columbia University, and a master's in public policy from Princeton University. In 2014, she received a presidential award for meritorious service from the American Association of Public Health Physicians. And in 2016, she received the American Veterinary Epidemiologic Society uh, Award uh, for her work in One Health. We are thrilled to have her joining us today for what I am sure will be an illuminating discussion around both the biological and political causes for the current worldwide COVID-19 pandemic. Just before we start, a brief mention about logistics. Uh, Dr. Khan will speak for about 40 minutes or so. We encourage all of you to enter your questions using the Q&A function on Zoom at any time during her talk, though we will be holding them until the end for a moderated Q&A session. So please hold on to the end and we will get to your questions and make sure they get answered. I also wanna give a special thanks uh, to Professor Richard Snyder for making our introductions to Dr. Khan and again to the Taubman Center for co-sponsoring this event with us today. Uh, so without further ado, I will turn it over uh, to Dr. Khan to begin her talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Levine. And I'm delighted to be here today. Uh, thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, I am going to talk about One Health and leadership during this pandemic. Um, next slide. I'm going to split my talk into two parts. The first part's gonna focus more on the biological medical side of it. And the second part will be the political side of it. So let's start with the first part. Uh, this concept of One Health, human, animal, and environmental health, that might seem obvious, but it's generally not how we approach health and disease. It gives you a satellite perspective, particularly on zoonotic diseases such as COVID-19. These are animal pathogens that are spreading into humans. And ideally, we want to prevent such events from happening rather than responding to them, running after them, if you will. Why are they emerging into human populations? Next slide, please. So again, this One Health concept, human, animal, and environmental or ecosystem health are linked. It provides a very useful framework for examining complex issues such as food security and emerging zoonotic diseases. And this pandemic is very much tied in with food security. Um, we must examine the root causes of these spillover events if we're to develop effective policies to address them. And I think it's important to point out that we interact with our environment every day by inhaling air, eating plants and animals, drinking water and other fluids. We literally ingest the environment into our body. So it's a very profound relationship. And even though we spend most of our time indoors, we're still interacting with the environment. I just like to point out the One Health Initiative uh, URL, our website, it's uh, free, it's a labor of love. Uh, please visit it. It's been serving as a repository for all news and information pertaining to the One Health uh, concept since 2008. Uh, and please tell your friends and colleagues as well. Next slide, please. So I had alluded to food security. Uh, agriculture and the food security that it provides is the foundation of civilization. Food security is another way of simply saying no hungry people. Um, and in 1996, the World Food Summit defined food security as existing when all people at all times have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe and nutritious foods to meet their needs. It's based on the pillars of availability, access and use. Next slide, please. And food security or zero hunger is so important that it's number two of the UN sustainable development goals. So it is extremely important. We have about 7.5 billion humans now on the planet. 
uh, with the combination of about 30 billion food animals, that means that we constitute collectively about 96 to 98 percent of the total mammalian zoo mass on the planet, the terrestrial zoo mass on the planet. So there's a lot of us uh, and we all need to be fed. So this is a very tall order uh, as the climate uh, continues to warm. Next slide, please. So uh, food security is so important. Um, in 1948, the UN declared food to be a human right, um, but it did not specify what type of food. And the question we must ask as a global society is should a meat rich diet be a human right? And by meat rich, I mean meat uh, several times a week, not with every single meal. But the question is, if we decide that a meat rich uh, diet is a human right, what type of meat? Does that include only domesticated animals or does that include wild animals? Because that has a profound impact on our ability to try to control these spillover events. Next slide, please. Meat consumption is a uh, very important um, uh, element in, in our discussion here. Uh, there are a number of countries where meat consumption is very high. The United States is the highest uh, country with total meat consumption per capita. We are at the top of the uh, list of countries and that means that we are in no moral position to tell other countries what they can or cannot eat. Next slide, please. Now there are pros and cons of eating meat. So the pros, for example, is that meat provides important micronutrients such as vitamin B12 and iron. There's even evidence to suggest that we evolved into modern humans because we hunted, cooked, and ate meat. It is a very nutrient dense food. And eating meat is an important part, an integral part of many religions and cultures. Again, very important part of American culture. Now there are cons to eating meat. Uh, if you supplement it with some of the essential uh, nutrients that it provides, if you supplement your diet, uh, you can live a fine life as a vegetarian or as a vegan. Raising domesticated animals in concentrated conditions and or hunting wild animals will not only contaminate the environment because all of these animals do create a lot of waste, uh, but eating wild animals reduces biodiversity and there aren't that many wild animals left. Uh, and eating uh, exotic animals increases zoonotic spillover risks. Next slide, please. So again, to reiterate, it's, it's a two-way street. It's not just going from animals to humans. We also give our microbes to the animals. Um, evidence that tuberculosis actually came, went from humans to animals. We infected our livestock thousands of years ago. But many of these zoonotic diseases are emerging either directly or indirectly from the global society's demand for meat and other animal proteins. Next slide, please. So what exactly does a spillover event mean from a uh, biomedical technical point of view. Well, if you look at uh, the coronavirus uh, pictured at the top left of the slide, you can see all these spikes emerging from its surface. And you can think of those spikes as little keys sticking out. Um, and those keys are uh, used to insert into the locks of a cell. All cells have receptors. Uh, and it's the uh, ability of some of these keys to fit into the receptor. So uh, our, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is an RNA virus. 
uh, just like influenza and uh, the first SARS. And they have some uh, rather sloppy reproduction that can contribute to mutations. And it's these mutations then that allow the virus to evolve newly reconfigured uh, spike proteins or keys. So if you look at the image at the bottom of the slide, you can see that uh, some of these proteins will not fit into the receptor very well, but if it evolves to fit into the receptor well, then that's when a spillover event can occur because it can now access the cell. So how does a virus work? If you look at the image on the right, now viruses are technically not alive, so you can't kill them, but what you can do is you can block their action. And what they do since they're parasites is they attach themselves using their keys, they attach themselves to the surface of the cell, open the lock and let themselves in, uh, and then they turn the cell machinery over into a virus making machine so that the cell starts to uh, replicate viral proteins. The viral proteins will reassemble and then burst out of the cell uh, and the cycle continues. So it's a, it's a parasite. It cannot reproduce on its own. It doesn't eat, it doesn't eliminate. It is technically not alive. Uh, so the, the key then, or the, the, the takeaway message is that it's these keys, the, the viral keys that allow them to open up the lock of the cell. And so this particular coronavirus has evolved to allow itself to open up human cells. Next slide, please. So uh, unfortunately, this isn't the first and it's not going to be the last of zoonotic viruses to emerge into human populations. And we've been seeing many of them uh, for at least the past 50 plus years um, and they are going to continue. What's most important though, is we are not thinking strategically. And what we are doing is we are running around putting out the viral fires instead of trying to come up with ways to prevent them. Now, public health generally focuses just on humans. So we wait until a disease appears in humans before we do something about it. The goal of One Health is to look at the upstream drivers of disease, you know, what's contributing to these zoonotic spillover events that go from animals into humans. The goal is to break down the silos between human, animal, and environmental health to try to prevent these zoonotic spillover events. Now, it's important to point out that SARS, when it emerged in 2003, really blindsided the medical and public health communities. But the veterinary medical community has known about coronaviruses since 1931. So they are well acquainted with these viruses and they've been dealing with them for decades. Uh, and if we actually talk to them, they could tell us many of the properties of these outbreaks that they've been experiencing in animals, particularly livestock, uh, for, for many, many years. And these outbreaks are explosive with high mortality rates uh, and uh, uh, airborne. They can affect the animal's respiratory tract, their gastrointestinal tract, their nervous systems. Um, these viruses um, are, be the virus that we are dealing with now uh, has many similarities, commonalities with the coronaviruses in past decades in animals. Uh, so it is in our uh, best interest then to collaborate with professionals who are dealing with other species to better understand and to predict uh, what might come next. Next slide, please. So um, the fact that SARS emerged in 2003 uh, the threat of another SARS-like virus has been known for a long time. 
Uh, this article in Clinical Microbiology Reviews was published in October of 2007. And the conclusion was, it's highlighted in yellow, the presence of a large reservoir of SARS-CoV-like viruses in horseshoe bats, together with the culture of eating exotic mammals in China, is a time bomb. And so uh, the conditions have not changed since that time. Next slide, please. So it was predictable that this was going to happen. And indeed it did. Now the first SARS emerged in 2003 in the Guangdong province of Southern China. This virus has appeared in 2019 in Wuhan, uh, one of the uh, uh, other more Northern province uh, region, the Hubei province of China. So it's indeed related to SARS as well as to the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus that emerged in Saudi Arabia in 2012. The reservoir species for all three is the bat. Um, it's not clear what the intermediate host species might be for this particular one, whether it's pangolins or something else, we're not entirely sure. Next slide, please. But horseshoe bats are an important species and we can't demonize bats because they serve very important eco, ecological functions. They do live in tropical and subtropical regions of Africa, Asia, and Europe. Uh, they're called horseshoe bats because of the uh, nose uh, configuration. Um, they are hunted for food in Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. They're guanos used in medicines. And again, they are the reservoir host species for the coronaviruses that have affected humans. Next slide, please. This is an example of the wet market in Wuhan, China, not particularly known for its uh, sanitation and hygiene. Uh, the preference in, the in many of these wet markets is to have live animals uh, and that uh, it ensures the freshness of the meat. They might not have access to refrigeration. Uh, so live animals are fresh. Uh, unfortunately, having live animals in close proximity to each other helps to facilitate viral spread. Next slide, please. So the question then, the key question is, should the wildlife trade and live animal markets be banned to stop further microbial spillover events. Now, it's important to mention that there was an effort to ban them after SARS, uh, but because of public demand, a black market appeared uh, and it's easier said than done to just stop uh, these activities. Um, if people want them, they will find a way to eat these animals. Next slide, please. I think it's uh, important to compare um, China and India because both of them have live animal markets. Next slide, please. Now, both China and India have over 1 billion people. They both have serious issues with sanitation and hygiene. They both are the number one and number two users of antibiotics in the world. They have severe problems with antimicrobial resistance. Indeed, India has some of the most uh, resistant bacteria in the world. Only China, however, has a tradition of eating wild animals and using them in Chinese medicines. India, in contrast, uh, has the highest fraction of vegetarians in any country in the world. 80% of Indians are Hindu and 40% are vegetarian. So they do not have a tradition of eating wild exotic animals the way China does. And as a result, it does not have uh, the zoonotic uh, coronavirus spillover events the way China has. Now that's not to say that India doesn't have its uh, infectious disease problems, it certainly does. But because they are not eating um, these wild animals, they are less likely to have the coronavirus spillover events. Next slide, please. And it's important to point out the political implications of food insecurity. When food prices spike or when it uh, becomes incredibly, uh, obviously when, when food prices 
spike and when food becomes less accessible, you start to see civil unrest. And with climate change, uh, we need to anticipate more of these crises to occur. The Syrian civil war, for example, was preceded by three years of devastating drought, leading to very high uh, food prices. Uh, and then that contributed to uh, the emergence of civil unrest. So these have very important um, political implications, this whole notion of food security, uh, climate change, and global health and uh, civilization. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to delve into the second part of my talk, uh, the question of who's in charge, looking at leadership specifically during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, national governments are responsible for the health, safety, and well-being of their citizenry. And it's important to know, everybody's always asking who's in charge. Well, it's the political leaders who are in charge as per their nation's constitutions. All public health crises are political events. The more severe the crisis, the more political the events. And so we need to uh, improve our policies uh, in public policy, in public health policy, to improve our ability to respond to these crises. And in my talk, I'm going to focus on national and not regional or local leaders. However, their leadership, political leadership at the state and local level is as important, uh, if not in some ways more important than at the national level, but we're gonna talk about the national level uh, here. Next slide, please. Now, the US Constitution was written uh, in a time long before the germ theory of disease was discovered. And so there really was no, uh, modern medicine didn't exist. They of course did know about contagion and diseases. And so since there was no concept of the need to have national um, coordination, uh, they made public health a state and local responsibility as per the 10th amendment in the Bill of Rights. Um, as a result, each state has developed its own public health laws. Many of them are antiquated, and we, you can think of the United States as being a patchwork quilt uh, uh, configuration, if you will, uh, in terms of public health. There was an effort after 9-11 and anthrax to um, upgrade these antiquated state public health laws, but uh, they didn't get very far. So the role of the federal government then in the United States is to provide expert support and advice and to coordinate the responses across the states. But there's one big exception and that's at the nation's borders and that's through the Commerce Clause. And it authorizes the federal government to isolate and quarantine incoming travelers to prevent the spread of diseases from foreign countries. And that was an important oversight during the early stages of the pandemic because the US Commission Corps, whose, whose mission is to prevent diseases from coming into the country, was not mobilized or deployed to, uh, to the US airports to screen and quarantine incoming passengers from abroad. That was a major failing of the federal government. Next slide, please. So uh, when I did my master's in public policy uh, program at Princeton back in 2001, 2002, uh, the one political science course I took uh, was comparative bureaucracies. And while my husband thought that sounded incredibly boring, I actually was quite excited because I had worked both in the federal and state bureaucracies and was interested to learn to understand them from a more theoretical basis. Uh, and the reading that really stuck with me was the uh, readings by Max Weber, the German sociologist. And in his writings, he described an inherent tension between elected officials and the bureaucratic leaders. The elected officials want to implement their ideologically based policies, 
while the bureaucratic leaders prefer uh, expertise and the rule of law to achieve their mission and goals. Next slide, please. And when I read that, I immediately thought of the situation between President Ronald Reagan and C. Everett Koop, who was his Surgeon General. And there was definitely a tension between the two that was well uh, described um, in the book by Randy Schiltz and the band Played On, where he described the AIDS saga. Now, Sievert Koop had been appointed largely because he was a staunch anti-abortionist. He was also a very distinguished pediatric surgeon at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and when AIDS hit, um, you know, the Reagan administration initially ignored or downplayed the crisis. Uh, and eventually, because of um, public demand, uh, he uh, asked uh, C. Everett Koop to investigate. And so C. Everett Koop, uh, to his credit, went around the country talking to physicians, to community activists, uh, to scientists, uh, and he determined that AIDS was a public health crisis and not a moral failing. And so uh, by himself, uh, he um, developed uh, pamphlets, millions of them, urging the importance of uh, safe sex, um, condoms, sex education, uh, needle exchange programs, uh, and without White House knowledge or approval, he distributed these pamphlets to the general public. Uh, that raised quite an uproar among the uh, White House and the conservatives. Uh, the public health uh, community, however, was amazed and delighted by what he did. But anyway, his actions very well likely have, might have cost him his job because uh, he was terminated. Um, but that example really made me think about the relationship then between the political leader and the expert appointee. Next slide, please. So when I did my research on leadership during epidemics, I looked at the relationship then between the political leader and the public health leader, looking at their relationships and then looking at their outcomes. Uh, and so there's, you know, at the very root then, there's at least two leaders during an epidemic, political leader and public health leader. Next slide, please. So um, essentially to boil it down, there turned out to be two models of leadership during epidemics. And these um, models were determined by the political leader. In the first model, which I call politician centric, the political leader decides to keep primary decision-making, being the one prominent in public communication. However, that person will accept expert advice from their appointees. Um, this type of model is common with political leaders who are seeking higher office because they want to show that they're in charge. Uh, political leaders who need to show their dominance will tend to prefer this model. If the political leader decides that they are in over their head or they really aren't interested in being the one in front of the cameras um, during this public, during a public health crisis, then they will delegate. Uh, that leads us to model two, which is the public health centric model. The political leader delegates decision making to their appointee. They delegate public communication to their appointee. But most importantly, they provide their political support to their appointee. So they're not leaving their appointee just kind of hanging out to dry, if you will, if they make an unpopular decision. Uh, this model is very common in parliamentary systems. Uh, and you also see it in very secure political leaders who prefer to delegate responsibilities. But it's important to note that either model can work as long as the participants understand their roles and responsibilities. Next slide, please. So that brings me to two examples of uh, one of success and one of failure 
uh, looking at these models. So the first example is the smallpox outbreak of 1947 in New York City. And the uh, second example is the smallpox outbreak in 1894 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Next slide, please. So the smallpox outbreak of 1947 in New York City was, uh, one could argue, was a gold standard response. So what happened? The political leader was William O'Dwyer, who was the mayor of New York City, and he had appointed Dr. Israel Weinstein as commissioner of health. Uh, he, uh, mayor O'Dwyer followed model two. He delegated decision-making to Dr. Weinstein and provided his political support. When the smallpox outbreak was confirmed, uh, Dr. Weinstein notified the public right away and he assembled a team to develop a response plan. Mayor O'Dwyer famously let Dr. Weinstein vaccinate him for smallpox. He was very much on board providing as much political support as he could. It's important to note though also that this uh, outbreak occurred right after World War II and trust in government was at an all time high. Um, they were, the uh, New York City Department of Health had a sterling reputation uh, with the press. They were able to uh, suppress any kind of rumors quickly. Thousands volunteered to help. And in less than a month, they vaccinated 6 million people. And the end result was that 12 people got smallpox and two people died. Unfortunately, the vaccine is not without its uh, adverse uh, effects, and there were 46 cases of encephalitis from the virus. I mean, from the from the vaccine. Uh, so uh, you know that that did have a negative uh, an outcome, but two people died from the actual uh, vaccine. Next slide, please. Now, it contrasts this with the smallpox outbreak of 1894 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The political leader at the time was John C. Cook, and he had appointed Dr. Walter Kempster as health commissioner. Again, it appears that uh, Mayor Cook followed model two in that he delegated decision-making to his appointee. When the number of smallpox cases began to increase, Dr. Kempster gave false reassurances to the public that everything was under control. The Milwaukee Sentinel, the local paper, noted that most cases were in Polish immigrants in the south side of town. Rumors spread that there was brutality going on in the hospital where smallpox patients were being taken. They had differing policies depending on people's wealth so that poor people were forced to go into the hospital while the wealthy were allowed to stay in their homes. Uh, riots then broke out for over a month and a year later, almost 900 people got smallpox and 244 people died. So I think you can see some of the mistakes that were being made during that, uh, that outbreak. Next slide, please. But the bottom line is that the key for good leadership of any good public health epidemic response is honesty, transparency uh, to instill public trust because it really is public trust uh, that will determine the success or failure of an outbreak. Next slide, please. So now let's turn to COVID-19. And uh, this data is, was updated this morning. Um, and unfortunately, there are now uh, over 41 million cases. The US has 8 million of them. Uh, and unfortunately, we also have the most deaths. We now have over 222,000 deaths uh, out of the 1 million global deaths. Next slide, please. This data, by the way, is from Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center, not from the CDC, which is um, distressing in and of itself. 
some of the mortality rates of selected countries that I will be briefly discussing. Belgium has one of the highest rates at 92 uh, deaths per 100,000 population. The US and the UK were uh, kind of tied, uh, but the US is now, the UK had been ahead of the US. The US has now overtaken the UK, uh, 68 to 67. Next is Sweden. Uh, Germany is down at 12. And then you get uh, the countries with really good responses, South Korea, New Zealand, China, Taiwan, and Mongolia. However, it's important to point out that China's data, um, I'm just going to take it uh, with, uh, you have to take it a little bit with a grain of salt. Uh, anyway, this data was updated again as of today. Next slide, please. So let's look briefly at the leader responses in these selected countries. Next slide. Now, uh, Belgium's high rates might be due to overreporting because they are combining both suspected and confirmed cases. Now, it's interesting that the political leader, Sophie Wilmes, I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce her name, she was the former budget minister and she was placed in charge of the government as kind of a placeholder position right before the COVID-19 pandemic hit. Um, it's a very divided country between the French speaking South and the Dutch speaking North. Uh, she was slow to respond initially. Um, there's been a lot of public opposition to her policies, uh, but the both po political parties did agree to give her special powers for six months to address the pandemic. Um, the, uh, um, this isn't necessarily her appointee, but Dr. Maggie DeBlock is a very popular politician. She's the Minister of Health, um, appears to be a very dominant personality. Uh, in 2018, she destroyed outdated face masks and didn't replace them. Uh, and she was blamed for the PPE shortages, but stated that masks gave the public a false sense of security. I couldn't tell so far what the relationship is between these two political leaders. Um, and so there isn't um, a lot right now that I can say as to whether or not uh, what model uh, uh, Prime Minister Wilmes is following, but nevertheless, given the, um, you know, the uh, death rate, um, they are not being uh, successful from from what uh, one can tell. Next slide, please. That brings me to the USA. Um, Donald Trump is failing spectacularly at model one. He has made every mistake you can make and then some. He has consistently downplayed the severity of the crisis. He is not listening to expert advice. He is providing false reassurances, finding scapegoats to blame, politicizing response measures, being dishonest during press conferences, and hosting rallies that spread the event. Now, it's interesting that he is um, right now, it appears to be uh, at war with Dr. Tony Fauci. The interesting thing is that Dr. Fauci is not even in the chain of command because the chain of command is uh, Alex Azar, HHS secretary, Stephen Hahn, the FDA commissioner, and Dr. Robert Redfield, who's the CDC director. One would expect the CDC director to be playing a leading role during this pandemic, but he's been essentially invisible. Dr. Tony Fauci, who's a head of a research institution, um, has been the, or was initially uh, an important spokesperson, um, but it appears that Donald Trump was feeling threatened by having him in front of the cameras. Uh, he cannot tolerate having anybody in front of the cameras except for himself. Uh, and he has completely lost public trust, um, which puts us in a very, very bad state indeed. Next slide, please. 
And in fact, this one study uh, that was done at Cornell University found that uh, Donald Trump was the single largest driver of coronavirus misinformation uh, in, in, in the media. Next slide, please. Um, this um, study done, published in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists found that um, the human cost of Trump's pandemic response was more than 100,000 unnecessary deaths. Uh, this work uh, is uh, followed with other studies, other editorials, most uh, recently the New England Journal of Medicine, which also has determined that um, his poor leadership has led to many, many unnecessary deaths. Next slide, please. Let's quickly look at the United Kingdom. Um, Boris Johnson appears to be failing at model one. Uh, again, uh, one would expect a parliamentary system often follows model two, but not the case here. Um, very uh, Trumpian in his response. He was slow to respond, reluctant to impose a lockdown, underestimated the virus's severity. Uh, and then he wound up getting the virus, although it was earlier in the pandemic. So he actually wound up in the intensive care unit uh, and uh, was very sick indeed. Um, his, um, he again does not appear to be listening to uh, expert advisors the way Donald Trump is and prefers to do most of the public communication, uh, which might explain why their death rate is so close to ours. Next slide, please. Sweden, uh, very interesting. The prime minister, the political leader, Stefan Löfven, uh, appears to follow model two. He delegated decision-making to Dr. Tegnell, who is the state epidemiologist. Um, they advocated, Dr. Tegnell advocated that the Swedish society remain open they issued recommendations, but not mandates. Uh, and so they recommended a lockdown and most Swedes observed them. Um, however, uh, Sweden has a, a large elderly population and a cold climate uh, and that high risk population was not protected uh, and they were hit very hard. Um, and so as a result, they have a very high death rate. Uh, and uh, Prime Minister Lofen has promised to launch an inquiry into the uh, pandemic response uh, to quell uh, public anger over the high nursing home death rate and initial low coronavirus testing rate. Next slide, please. Now, Angela Merkel, uh, she, she has done a much better job than um, the countries that I had previously mentioned. She is a scientist herself. She understands science and scientific uh, uncertainty. Uh, she seems to be following model one. Um, she has a very well-respected, uh, Germany has a well-respected system of scientific and medical expertise. Uh, and she seems to be listening to them. She convened a coronavirus task force. She's been honest and has communicated very effectively with the public and has their trust. Uh, and so as a result, their, um, their death rate is far less than the countries profiled, but not quite as low as the countries that I will be discussing that have done a much better job. Next slide, please. Uh, China, where the pandemic began, I was actually expecting to find President Xi Jinping to have followed model one but I was surprised that he appears to be following model two. Initially, he was accused of being sluggish or invisible uh, and then subsequently implemented draconian measures in Wuhan. Um, however, as the uh, pandemic progressed, um, he delegated decision-making. He appointed Premier Li Keqiang uh, to a high-level group uh, to develop policies. He delegated um, to uh, Vice Premier Sun Chunlan uh, to lead the local response in Wuhan. And he delegated public communication to Dr. Zhang Nanshan 
uh, who was a hero during the, start, the SARS epidemic of 2003, uh, he was appointed as the national spokesperson. Uh, the National Health Commission minister, however, appears to be uh, not well consulted, uh, nor uh, playing a, a large role in, in the response. Next, next slide, please. So the most effective leader responses, these are examples of them. Uh, Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern uh, responded very powerfully. Uh, she was in office and even gave birth in office. Um, she has been uh, extremely effective in public communication. Uh, she relies on science and promotes empathy and kindness, giving weekly updates from her home. Uh, she appears to be using Model 1 to great success. Uh, president of Taiwan, Tsai Ing-wen, she learned from SARS. Uh, many of the Asian countries did get experience dealing with SARS in 2003, uh, which uh, helped in their preparations for this pandemic. She implemented early travel restrictions, quarantine measures. Taiwan has an excellent uh, hospital, public-private partnerships. Um, and they also, she also has a health minister uh, who has, who's an epidemiologist, uh, who also headed Taiwan's uh, Central Epidemic Command Center. South Korea Prime Minister uh, managed to flatten the curve without draconian lockdowns. He responded swiftly to the epidemic, uh, conducted widespread testing and contact tracing, and has had a lot of public trust and support. And again, most importantly, he's had experience with MERS. And perhaps the most interesting is the president of Mongolia, whose name I cannot pronounce, nor will I try, but he has the perfect response of zero deaths. Now, even though they share a border with China, the minute that the uh, outbreak appeared, he shut the border to China uh, and um, responded before there were any cases even in the country. Um, quarantined all returning Mongolians, and he himself even went into quarantine. And as a result, they have zero deaths. So he probably has exemplified one of the best responses uh, globally. Next slide, please. So um, I think it's important to point out that um, there's been concerns that uh, public policies responding to public health crises don't necessarily include public health data. And this is an important um, publication, uh, Basic Epidemiology, published by the World Health Organization in 2006. And they state that to date, epidemiology has not fulfilled its potential in preventing and controlling diseases um, because there are few areas in which epidemiologic research has been fully applied. Now I have to admit, when I graduated from the School of Public Health, I had naively assumed that policies were made using the best data. And after working in bureaucracies, both at the federal and the state, uh, I learned that policies do not necessarily involve uh, the best data, but rather political patronage. Um, and I don't think most public health, people who go into public health are prepared for the political realities of their jobs. And I think this page, chapter 10, page 166, is extremely important for as we move forward, we're going to need much closer ties between schools of public policy and schools of public health to be able to handle the types of crisis that we're dealing with um, to develop better public health policies. Next slide, please. And I can go on about that, uh, but for the sake of time, I will leave it to the Q&A. Now, it's quite surprising that the wearing of a mask has been politicized by our president even though there's now studies showing that COVID-19 can be spread by airborne, by small particles that can drift through the air and float for 
period of time in, indoors. Um, this is a public health policy, unfortunately, that has been haphazardly implemented by various governors across different states. Next slide, please. So it's quite tragic then that Donald Trump politicized wearing face masks because since he refused to wear a face mask, most of his followers have refused to wear it too. And who would have associated wearing a mask as a sign of masculine weakness? This, this conflict between fearless macho versus reckless behavior. Uh, and in contrast, you see other political leaders that make it a point of serving as role models and wearing face masks. Next slide, please. So I think it's important to realize that public health crises are uh, political. They are inherently political events. Uh, and I think schools of public health must do a much better job preparing their graduates for the political realities of their work. And uh, it's quite tragic that a number of health officials, particularly in California, received death threats uh, because they were merely trying to implement policies to save lives. Um, leadership and communication skills can be taught to public health professionals. They're not necessarily taught now, um, but uh, you know, those are skills that are extremely important in order to get public trust. Next slide, please. Now, sometimes even the best data is not enough. People are hardwired for stories and not for statistics. And while you might have solid data, facts and science-based data might not uh, might uh, not dissuade people with firmly held beliefs, uh, whether they want to follow your policies or not. And I think it's important to get humanists on board to collaborate with public health professionals to develop narratives to counter some of the fear mongering that some of these anti science forces can generate. Um, and so we need uh, just better collaboration across different disciplines to deal with these types of crises. Next slide, please. So uh, to, to kind of tie things up, we need to figure out how to sustainably feed ourselves and maintain our civilization on a hotter and drier planet. We need to integrate our efforts to benefit humans, animals, environments, and ecosystems. Food security is going to become increasingly important in the decades ahead. And we're gonna to have to try and figure out how to maintain food security without unleashing more deadly zoonotic diseases upon ourselves. And that's going to require a One Health approach looking at not just humans, but at the animals, both wild and domestic, uh, as well as the environment. Next slide, please. In terms of leadership, it is essential to have competent and effective both political and public health leadership if we wanna save lives during these types of crises. We need to have leaders who are honest, transparent, and admit what is known or not known in order to inspire public trust, which is absolutely essential for an effective response. Politicians might either uh, delegate decision-making responsibilities to their expert appointees or obtain expert advice from their appointees, maintaining main decision-making uh, responsibilities for themselves. It's important to note that either model one or model two can be effective and work as long as the parties understand their roles and responsibilities. We need to have public health professionals prepared for the political realities of their jobs in order to be able to effectively respond to crises. And I have want to reiterate that schools of public policy and schools of public health must work together to develop robust public health policies that the public can understand and adhere to during a crisis. Next slide, please. So uh, lastly, I want to just acknowledge my colleagues in the One Health Initiative. We were co-founded in 2006. Our website established in 2008. There's uh, the team. Uh, next slide, please. And um, thank you again for your time and attention. And I'm happy to take any questions.
Well, thank you so much for that illuminating talk. And um, I am excited that we already have a few questions in the Q&A box. Um, please, if anyone has additional questions, type them in and we will get right to it. So um, the first uh, question that uh, we have for you from uh, the audience, uh, I think is a really pertinent one. Um, when is the line crossed between not wanting to alarm the population and being transparent about something serious that is going on, I guess in reference to um, leadership during pandemics? Right. Uh, well, I think it's, um, you can be honest and transparent uh, without scaremongering. Uh, you know, it, it depends upon how good a communicator you are. Uh, public health and leaders and scientists tend to resort, tend to fall back on jargon, which people don't understand. People generally don't understand the concept of risk. Public politicians, on the other hand, are very good at communicating, but they don't understand risk and they tend to provide false reassurances because they want to prove that they're in charge and they're competent. So it's a fine line uh, to be able to admit, it's a skill actually, to be able to admit transparently, transparently that this is what we know, this is what we don't know, and this is what we advise you to do in the meantime while we get more information. Uh, I think that's much more important than just saying this virus will just go away. That was arguably one of the most dishonest uh, criminal statements that uh, the president could make to just downplay the severity and you know making all sorts of uh, blatantly wrong statements uh, during the early phases of, of the pandemic. So uh, you know you you can be honest without being histrionic, uh, you know being truthful without being uh, alarmist. Uh, it all depends on how you present it. Uh, and it's up to the political leaders to maintain calm uh, and to be able to communicate that to the public. Well, following up on that question, uh, sort of related to uh, our leadership here in the United States, uh, we have a question uh, regarding the uh, preliminary or the development of uh, COVID-19 vaccines. and. Uh, we would like to hear your thoughts on uh, the development of an early COVID vaccine and whether you believe that vaccine will be safe, how the public can be assured that the vaccine is safe given the politicization of this entire response. Yeah, well, unfortunately, because the whole response has been so politicized, it's going to be very hard to get public trust for a vaccine. Now, even in the best of situations, we have the flu that comes around every year. And even then, um, you know, a large fraction of the public do not get the flu vaccine because for a variety of reasons, many might not trust it. And it's important to note that no vaccine is 100% effective. And many of the flu vaccines will range from 50% or less in terms of uh, efficacy. So um, pushing through a vaccine so quickly is going to risk uh, reducing public trust. And you can develop the best vaccine in the world, but if the public doesn't trust it and are not willing to get vaccinated, then you, it's not going to get you very far in containing the outbreak. Yes. Um. Yeah, and we certainly saw that actually with Ebola where we developed a very okay. effective vaccine during the West Africa outbreak. Uh, and yet we still had this major outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo in 2018 right. and 2019 that killed over 2000 people despite having an effective vaccine. Uh, That's largely. right, and there was, there was a lot of politics and a lot of mistrust and a lot of, um, you know, uh, scare mon fear mongering. So it, it was a less than optimal situation. And it, it's really quite tragic how often you see this. Uh, it would seem to be pretty, you know, straightforward for, for elected officials and public health officials to, to understand this and to respond appropriately. But in fact, that's generally not the case. Yeah, following on that, if I can ask kind of a question from my own personal experience. So 
In 2014, when I was responding to the Ebola epidemic in Liberia, um, I heard a lot from people, uh, mostly expatriates on the ground, about uh, how in, in many, often in very racist ways, how it was local culture that was responsible for the outbreak uh, of Ebola virus disease, the fact that Liberians didn't trust government, that they didn't believe in science, uh, all, they had all these backwards traditions, and that's why we were seeing such a large outbreak in Liberia. And at the time I said, uh, which I think proved to be very prescient that you know, no country has a monopoly on crazy. There is crazy ideas everywhere. Yeah. And you can certainly see that right now during the COVID-19 pandemic around the world. But yeah. I'm hearing those same things again right now with COVID-19. I hear things like, well, one of the reasons that we're doing so poorly in the US is because of American culture, that we're too individualistic, uh, that Americans are too independent to follow uh, government advice that Asian people are doing better because they are used to following rules and they're good at, follow, at wearing masks. Do you think there's any truth to this cultural argument uh, for the disparities in mortality rates that we're seeing across countries? Or is it really, as you say, uh, related to leadership and uh, government actions? I, I think a lot of it is leadership and government actions. Uh, you know, it really depends on what your elected officials are saying, how much trust there is, if we had had a different leader who uh, was truthful uh, and who actually helped to coordinate responses across states rather than pitting states against each other, um, they could have had a, a uh, rather than a general blatant lockdown across the whole country, even though there were regions that weren't affected at that point, they could have had targeted responses uh, to try to stamp down the virus where it was, you know, most severe, uh, because now we've got virus fatigue where, you know, people are just tired of dealing with it. And um, again, it's, it's all leadership. Uh, I don't think the people in Asia are that much different than the people in Europe, but, um, you know, they have uh, leaders that are emphasizing wearing masks and, uh, you know, working collaboratively. So, uh, you know, those are the results that you see. Okay. Um, we have a couple uh, questions from our students um, that relate to their own sort of training and how uh, they can uh, develop their careers. So one question is, you mentioned some of the culture shock you experienced when you were a recent graduate of your public health degree. What advice or insight would you lend to a recent graduate that is looking to understand uh, slash get more involved in this area? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it would have been really helpful for me to understand the politics of public health, and that just wasn't really taught in my uh, public health curriculum. Now, I took a course on, the, the, the course on health policy was health policy and management, teaching you how to manage a hospital. And that is very, very different than working in public health. Um, now that's not to say that there isn't politics in whatever organization you work in because all organizations have different, differing levels of politics, but the politics of working uh, in the public sector are quite different. Um, and I think it would have been helpful if I had been prepared for that better than I was. Uh, perhaps through, lead, uh, through uh, various readings, discussions, um, that, that would have been much more helpful than uh, what I was prepared for. There were, there were no courses dealing with the politics of public health. Um, and continuing along that strain and going back to the first half of your talk about One Health, uh, to what extent has One Health been integrated into uh, public health schools and MPH programs? And you know, what needs to be done to really incorporate uh, these ideas into the curriculum that's training our future public health workforce? Thank you for that question. That's on my do to do list. <laughs> that's what I would like to do is to see uh, One Health being incorporated into the curriculum of schools of public health. I think there are some schools that do offer a class here and there. Uh, I think there needs to be a track, a One Health track to prepare the graduates for the challenges of the 21st century. We're gonna be dealing with uh, food safety and security, antimicrobial resistance, emerging diseases, uh, climate change, 
Um, all of these things are going to be profoundly impacting global health, and I think we need a new track. Uh, and uh, you know, some schools are a bit further along than others. So I hope I hope to uh, be able to be a participant in that. I mean, I am writing books that I'm hoping will be used as resources and classes, courses that will be offered. But but you know, it's it's a brand new field. And so we're really at the beginning of it. Great. Um, so uh, I have another question for you, but I'll also just remind folks, this is your chance. If you have questions to please put them up uh, so that we can ask them. Um, so we're familiar with the tension between economic development and climate change action, but it seems that there's another important tension between economic development and One Health as we build roads and develop previously wild spaces, as do we domesticate and raise larger numbers of animals, we increase the risk of spillover events from animals to humans that can lead to global pandemics such as our current one. How do we resolve these tensions in order to assure rich and poor countries alike that One Health need not limit economic development? That's a really great question and one that I think you can devote an entire curriculum to, course to anyway. Um, yeah, well, I mean, we have to feed 7.5 billion people in an equitable, sustainable way in a planet with diminishing natural resources. And uh, as I said earlier in my talk, the U.S. is in no moral position to tell people in other countries what they can or cannot eat. We eat more meat than any other country. Um, that having been said, there are efforts uh, to develop uh, protein-based plant alternatives uh, in this country that perhaps we can develop uh, proteins without the animals and make that reduce the spillover risk. But you know, those are very early in their uh, development. They're not, they're, they're expensive. Uh, so I don't see that as substituting animal proteins anytime soon. Uh, let's not, under, let's not underestimate the uh, impact of religion. Again, country India, for example, has more vegetarians than any other country in the world. Um, you know, they are vegetarian because of their religion. Uh, and, and religion is a great uh, motivator of behavior. Um, and so certainly there are vegetarians uh, in the world who might not be you know, Hindu, uh, but we need to develop strategies to promote uh, uh, diets that reduce the amount of animal proteins. I, I also want to point out um, that there was work done, I guess about 10 years ago with the, I don't know if you're familiar with the Blue Zones, the Blue Zones um, written by um, a journalist, Butner, who worked collaboratively with the National Geographic Society, went around the world looking for the longest lived humans and to look at what they ate. And uh, he found that there were five, and there appeared to be five regions uh, that had the longest lived people. There was Okinawa, Japan, there was a place in, in Greece, in Sardinia, Italy, in uh, in Loma Linda, California, Costa Rica, and uh, I, I think that was that was it. But what, what was important to note was that none of them were vegetarian, but none of them ate a lot of meat in their diet. At most 5% of their diet was meat or other animal proteins. The rest was fruit and vegetables, nuts, things like that. So, um, I don't think people need to go vegetarian, completely vegetarian or vegan. I think it's unrealistic, but the amount of meat that we eat, particularly in the US uh, and other affluent countries um, should be a lot less than what it is. So we have a, a question uh, pointing out kind of the irony of the fact that uh, initially when the pandemic first began and mortality in most countries was very low, we actually saw people following rules and regulations um, such as social distancing at a, a higher degree. But now that uh, the infection is raging and taking a heavier toll, people are ignoring even basic norms. Um, 
why and how could people be made aware about the seriousness of the disease? Well, I think we're, we're seeing fatigue. Um, people are tired of being locked down or you know, having their behavior restricted, not being able to get together with friends or families. Uh, you know, we've, we've made a, a strong effort uh, in the spring to try and bring down the curve. We did bring down the curve uh, and then summer came uh, and we were able to spend a lot of time outdoors. Uh, unfortunately, now the weather in the northern hemisphere is starting to get cold and people are going indoors and the rates are going back up. So, um, you know, it's, it's a very worrying trend. Uh, again, public trust is essential uh, to trust your leaders. Uh, and, you know, we have a president who is hosting super spreading events and who continues to downplay the severity of this virus. So that is counterproductive to our efforts, at least in this country, of trying to get this virus under control. So um, if I could uh, add on a, a question um, by one of our uh, participants. So uh, just recently in the last uh, few years, um, the US and other countries spent a lot of money developing this idea of a global health security agenda that was really meant to protect us all from pandemic events like this one. And they created a global health security index to rank every country's ability to prepare for these events. There was an article published in uh, JAMA just recently showing the strange fact that some of the countries at the top of the global health security index have actually had the highest mortality rates. And they were arguing, I think similarly to you, that leadership uh, needs to be incorporated into future versions of this Global Health Security Index uh, since it was left out. Um, should we, going forward, really make assumptions um, that uh, leadership might undermine future responses, um, that certain countries with uh, certain leadership styles are going to have uh, worse, uh, worse outcomes with future events, and how does that play into our planning for responses to future biological emergencies, including both uh, natural emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases as well as bioterrorism? Well, I think if anything, this COVID-19 pandemic has shown is that leadership does matter. Uh, you can have a, a great system, but if you've got a really flawed leader, and I mean, who would have ever imagined that we would have a, uh, a uh, unqualified individual like Donald Trump as our president uh, who actively made the whole situation much, much worse. So I think any kind of planning has to include both public and both political and public health leadership. Um, back in 2003, when SARS emerged, I actually breathed a sigh of relief that the US dodged that bullet because our system, even though they said we were uh, prepared in, in that study, we really are not. I mean, we don't have, now Obamacare helped, but when you have a large fraction of the population without access to healthcare, um, or you've got uh, you know, a large fraction who are undocumented, if they are exposed to a deadly disease and they don't seek health care, then they're going to continue to spread it around the community. I think we can look at what happened with Ebola in Texas back in 2014, where we had a man from West Africa fly to a, a Texas to visit his fiance. He got sick, sought care, in a, at a local uh, Texas hospital was diagnosed with gastroenteritis, given antibiotics and sent home. Um, so, I mean, your ability to respond to these things are only as good as your weakest link. So our, our hospital system is arguably not prepared. Our public health system is, is a piecemeal system that varies from state to state. Uh, since the 2008 recession, uh, the public health has been absolutely gutted. We don't have the capability of doing contact tracing. Uh, you know, the whole botching of the testing rollout uh, was, was shocking. Um, we never deployed the commissioned core at the, uh, at the 
you know, the uh, ports, airports around the country. Um, it was just one spectacular mistake after another. They got rid of their pandemic planning team. I mean, it was like all the stars lined up <laughs> to do as bad a job as possible. I mean, it was really quite striking, but you know, the buck stops at the top. Uh, you absolutely have to have uh, political and public health leadership as a crucial part of that. And I think the public generally doesn't understand that who you vote for, who you elect to office could mean the difference between your life or death uh, in the event of a pandemic such as this. So it's extremely important and, and sure, maybe the person might be likable and you know, you'd wanna have a beer with them, but they might not be the best person. Now that having been said, we are actually very lucky that the virus emerged when it did. Because for example, Hurricane Katrina appeared during uh, uh, Bush's, George Bush's second term. So there wasn't much we could do. You know, it basically uh, ruined the rest of his, pre delegitimized his uh, political authority. We are very lucky that this virus has appeared in the last year of Trump's first term because it, he very likely could have gotten reelected and this virus could have appeared in the beginning of his second term. And then we would have been stuck with him for a full eight years. Uh, instead, we have an opportunity now to vote him out because he is spectacularly unqualified for his job. And this virus is showing us how spectacularly unqualified he is. He is not learning from his mistakes. He is just continuing on making the same mistakes over and over, doing a public uh, spat with Dr. Fauci, which makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Um, it's just shocking the behavior that he is displaying during this pandemic. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I have a, a grant from the CDC around global emergency response um, and work closely with the emergency response and recovery branch of the CDC uh, as part of that grant, which we're now in the fourth year of it. So I've gotten to see how the CDC has changed over the last four years of this grant. And what most of the public has seen is that every year Trump has uh, put forward a budget with large cuts to the CDC and every year Congress has overruled him and fully funded the CDC. But what they haven't seen is despite its full funding, uh, the loss of personnel at CDC that people have left and haven't been replaced. And so I've watched the emergency recovery and response branch go from 80 staff down to 30 staff. Uh, this was before the pandemic even. And so with that uh, decrease in preparedness at the body that's supposed to be responsible for handling uh, pandemics around the world, um, it's not surprising uh, that we saw what we did all right, I want to finish with uh, our last question here. Uh, and this kind of digs into, I mean, you, you gave us the how or sort of the reasons behind uh, the, uh, um, the differences between different countries in terms of the outcomes of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and you place that as at the feet of uh, leaders and government. Um, but the question uh, from this participant is why would certain leaders make decisions to not follow the science, to uh, not uh, trust experts, uh, to not provide good information? What are the reasons that drive that um, at the individual leader level? That's a great question. It's, it's hard to understand why leaders might feel threatened by the scientists. Um, again, you know, most political leaders want to show that they're in control, that they know everything, and they might not want to admit that they don't know the science. I mean, these types of crises are very technical, complicated, involve lots of uncertainties, particularly if they're a novel microbe that recently appeared in human populations. So there's a lot of unknowns. Uh, and they might feel personally threatened that uh, they might be showing weakness to have to rely on somebody else for answers. 
And so perhaps by downplaying that, uh, they are trying to compensate for their insecurities in not having the answer to everything. Um, that is the only thing I can think of that they feel personally threatened. Uh, and you find that particularly in very insecure individuals. Uh, certainly Donald Trump is one of the most insecure individuals, uh, you know, uh, and, and there's, we can spend hours talking about, you know, the psychology of, of Donald Trump, but uh, leaders who are insecure in their position and then their knowledge uh, might be more inclined to respond that way than those who are more confident uh, in their ability and their uh, comfort level in seeking expert advice. Okay. Well, that will conclude our Q&A session for today. I want to thank you again, Dr. Khan, for joining us here at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown University. Uh, and thank both the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies, as well as the uh, Taubman Center for American Politics and Policy for co-sponsoring this event. Um, it's been a real pleasure to, uh, to hear from you and to have this discussion today. My pleasure. Thank you so much for hosting, hosting me. Thank you. Yes, and thank you everyone for attending as well.